To the news now, and China's president ordered a national safety campaign after a massive gas explosion at a barbecue restaurant killed 31 people and injured seven others. The explosion was caused by a leak of a liquefied gas tank inside the restaurant in Inchuan. It occurred on the eve of the three-day Dragon Boat Festival holiday in China, a time when many families and friends gather for celebratory meals. The U.S. and China have pledged to stabilize their tense relationship following U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken's two-day visit to Beijing. President Xi Jinping says he's satisfied with progress made during the talks, with China's state media describing the exchange as candid and in-depth. The meeting restarted high-level communications between the rival superpowers. But while both sides claim they are open to further talks, it's clear major differences remain. For more, we're joined from Beijing by the BBC's China correspondent, Stephen MacDonald. Stephen, welcome to China Tonight. G'day, good to talk to you. Stephen, the meeting between Xi and Blinken was described as candid and in-depth. But what was actually achieved? You know, it is interesting because leads often say their meetings are candid. But this time round, we get these you know, you get these briefings when you have meetings like this from officials who are in the meetings, and it seems like they really were speaking their minds. And this is one of the reasons why the meetings went so long. So one of his meetings with the Chinese foreign minister, Qin Gang, went for seven and a half hours, if you can believe. I mean, there were various stages of the meeting. They moved on to dinner and kept talking. And apparently that's because in the early stages there was lots of venting from both sides. And it wasn't until they both had a really kind of angry rant at one another that they got to the point of being able to, all right, now let's try and move forward. And this is why they you know, kept extending these meetings. Now, in terms of what was achieved, look, the expectations were always quite low. Nobody thought they were going to sort out trade problems or the South China Sea. Establishing new lines of communication and setting up other visits for the future was good enough for both sides from the outset, really. And the fact that that has happened will have been seen as an achievement. However, of course, a day later, we then had the US president referring to Xi Jinping as a dictator. And so you wonder if that's all been undone. I mean, you'd love to have been a fly on the wall when Anthony Blinken got the news that Joe Biden said Xi Jinping was a dictator. I mean, he's just been to Beijing. He's just had all these meetings, put in all these huge efforts. They feel like progress has been made. And then, boom, just by using that one word, oh, it's almost like they're back to square one. So moving forward, what are the main challenges ahead for the US-China relationship? Well, according to the Chinese government, at these meetings that have just happened between Anthony Blinken and his Chinese counterparts, it's Taiwan. That, they, they just kept talking about Taiwan to the US, Taiwan, Taiwan, Taiwan. I mean, Qing Gang said Taiwan was at the core of China's core interests. He said this is the most important issue between the superpowers and the most dangerous one, the one that could potentially drift into conflict. And it's not hard to see how that would be possible. You know, we've seen these near misses from jets and from ships, and uh, all it would take was would be for one of those not to be a miss. It, it could be you know, the US and Chinese are sort of approaching one another in the air or at sea, and all of a sudden hit one another and then there's a response or there's a warning shot that actually goes too close and, yeah, they, they could be, be really shooting at one another. This is why the US side wanted to try to re-establish military-to-military -military lines of communications at, at, this, uh, at, at these meetings with Anthony Blinken, but the Chinese government is so far refusing to do this they cut these connections after um, Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan and haven't re-established them. It's now six months since China ended its zero-COVID policy and pivoted to living with a virus. Since then, China's Centre for Disease Control stopped publishing data on COVID cases and deaths, and China's government declared a victory in steering the country through the global pandemic. 
But experts say China is now facing another COVID wave, which could see up to 65 million cases a week by the end of June. Meanwhile, authorities have wasted no time in including China's COVID success story into school textbooks, with the reality of China's pandemic journey quietly being rewritten. <laughs> Huang Yicheng was there. The night hundreds of residents took to the streets of Shanghai in defiance against China's zero COVID policy. He's still trembling when he recalls the horror. The 27-year-old school teacher was part of the so-called white paper protests in November last year, when the public resentment of the harsh policy erupted across the country. People holding blank sheets of white papers to bypass censorship as a symbol of anti-lockdown protests and discontent. Fearing repercussions, Yi Cheng fled to Germany earlier this year and has been calling on the Chinese government to release the detainees. Weeks after the mass protests in early December, the Chinese government abruptly scrapped the zero COVID policy along with mass testing and daily case reports. Yeah, I think this is a combination of a government uh, willingness to reopen, but more about the each uh, resident's uh, uh, preference because the economy was really in a bad shape at that time. Uh, no one could afford to be locked down anytime more. So that's why I think this is a collective decision making. Within several weeks, the virus ripped through the nation, infecting 80% of the population of 1.4 billion people. Hospitals are under huge strain, stadiums turned into fever clinics, and crematoriums overwhelmed with bodies. But the official death toll for the first two months after the end of zero COVID was just above 83,000 people. Yeah, I think epidemiologists will agree this is the undercount because uh, for any government, when you measure something during the crisis, you may uh, undercount some uh, casualties. Uh, but uh, the question is uh, how large uh, this undercount may be. Some modeling suggests that COVID wave killed between 1 and 1.5 million Chinese people. But the country's lack of transparency has made it hard to verify. So in other words, China would say that uh, if, they, if they had had opened much earlier, the cash tape would be much higher. So they were trying to use a containment strategy to uh, to mitigate the transmission, reduce the casualty until the virus becoming milder, then they uh, lift those measures. In February, the Chinese Communist Party leaders declared a major decisive victory in combating the virus. We believe that with our leadership and the cooperation of the Chinese people, our fight against COVID-19 will be successful. And it's already written in history textbooks. Our country always puts the people and their lives first, effectively protected the people's lives and health, and achieved major positive results in coordinating COVID-19 response with economic and social development. While China seems to have moved on from the pandemic, the quest to trace the origins of the virus isn't going anywhere. 
A review by the New York Times of a dozen retracted papers found Beijing's censorship campaign has targeted international journals and scientific databases, shaking the very foundations of the shared scientific knowledge. My colleague and I found that there was a concerted effort to crack down on all kinds of scientific research in China early in the pandemic. Uh, scientists withholding data from key international databases, uh, with, in, scientists withdrawing data from those databases, and um, and then also data in in submissions to scientific journals um, actually being changed after submission. The Chinese officials rejected such criticism and called those charges intolerable. And China's National Bureau of Disease Control says the country did not conceal any cases, samples, and their test results when collaborating with the WHO. But Mara Wissendahl says China's crackdown on information has stymied efforts to understand the virus. The vast majority of cases at that time had happened in China. And there was a lot that that we could have learned about it, not not just about the origin of the virus, but also about how to treat people, very basic elements of, of, of how this virus worked. And, and that was lost with this crackdown. Stephen, you've lived in Beijing for 15 years. You made it through the zero COVID years and the extreme lockdowns. Now, things are supposedly business as usual, according to China's government. But what's the situation really like on the ground? It was some really tough years in China. I mean, like everywhere else, it was, also, it was tough in plenty of places. But you've got to remember the COVID crisis. It started here and it finished here at last. Funnily enough, though, although you can see of the economy and bounce back. I mean, people are going out to restaurants and things and it's quite lively in the streets. But it, the, the bounce back hasn't quite been what the government expected and consumption hasn't picked up to the extent that they'd hoped. So, for example, there are whole areas of the, the economy here it's still pretty sluggish post-COVID. Stephen, do people in China actually buy the narrative that China's COVID policy was a success? That is a, a, a big and interesting question, and I think it would differ from person to person. I mean, when it, when it abruptly ended, there certainly were many people I, I spoke to who just thought, well, seriously, why couldn't we have done that a year ago? Why did we keep going and going and going when we didn't have to continue with those lockdowns to the extent we did? Beijing had big areas of the city at times locked down or housing compounds locked down or people individually were told to stay at home. But we never had a citywide lockdown, a tough citywide lockdown, the way Shanghai did. So in Shanghai, for months on end, that mega city forced everybody to remain indoors. And it's no coincidence that when the protests happened towards the end, with people calling for this to stop, they wanted their lives back, that the most angry chants against the government and what have you started in Shanghai. So once those protests were happening, I think the government thought, we can't keep going with this, it's got to stop. And it just ended overnight, like, just boom, all of a sudden all the restrictions were gone. And this is why COVID hit China like wildfire at the end of last year. At times, it was managed really well here, especially in the early stages with no vaccines. When there were no vaccines, China was doing better than everywhere else. But then once the vaccines came in, people were looking around and saying, well, you know, the rest of the world's opened up. Why are we still in these lockdown situations? So, yeah, I think there'll be different views. Certainly some people would think the government did not handle it well towards the end, that's for sure. Stephen McDonnell, thank you so much for joining us on China Tonight. Great to talk to you. Anytime. To what's trending and more people in China want to buy houses again as market expectations improved and home loan rates were cut. 
The People's Bank of China is hoping to stimulate the economy, which has stalled post the pandemic. The gap between the current housing prices and reasonable prices is too wide. I won't consider it unless there is a significant reduction in price. What I need is a million yuan. They never mention cutting the property price. What's the point of issuing a 500 yuan coupon to purchase a Ferrari? Hey, with the right budgeting, you can really do a lot with that kind of money. Just last week, I received a 50 yuan coupon and I managed to buy this. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty sick, huh? All of my friends are married and own houses now. But do they have a paper Volkswagen? No! I didn't have enough money for the paper Ferrari, but still. Vroom, vroom! Me! And with more than 130 million views, is this guy a video of a father telling his son he would be happier without kids? Not sure if that's progressive advice from a cool dad or if he just wanted to tell his son he really regrets not getting that vasectomy. Young people really have it tough these days. I don't want my child to suffer too much in the future. Whether they want to get married or have children, it's their freedom. No regard for family or nation, just pursuing enjoyment. Is this kind of value system worth trending constantly? If everyone is like this, humanity will quickly perish. I thought about forwarding this to my mum, but then decided against it. Otherwise, I'll have nothing to eat. Shh! Stop telling everyone the secret! I've been saying to my mum for years now that I plan on having eight children just so I can get a free breakfast, lunch and dinner each day. Don't blow my cover, OK? Another story blowing up online involves this man who was publicly rejected by a woman. Definitely nothing new there, but his way of coping was to scream, she's a lesbian. <laughs> yeah, real mature. It's right up there with five-star comebacks like, shut up. His bizarre response sparked a flurry of comments from netizens. What is normal or abnormal when it comes to sexual orientation? What a joke. Thank goodness the girl said no. I pity whoever ends up with him, considering his demeanour. Either she really is a lesbian or she was just trying to save your face. And clearly this guy has never been to a nightclub before, otherwise he would have already heard that excuse. But no matter your sexual orientation, I think everyone can agree. This sad, sad man and his weird flashing flower bouquet gives us all the ick. China's current rules on assisted reproductive technology, or ART, are forcing many women to go overseas for treatment. ART is currently only available to heterosexual married couples, banning unmarried women from accessing procedures such as egg freezing. And there are no signs Beijing will change its stance. It's prompted women like 34-year-old Maya Lu to take matters into her own hands. The Beijing resident told reporter Joyce Cheng that travelling to Los Angeles to freeze her eggs had been life-changing. Go Maya! Not long now before China ends up with a fertility movement that looks like this. And with the country's declining birth rate, they should know better than to put all of their eggs in the married couple's only basket. Now, another topic on the agenda for US Secretary of State Antony Blinken's meeting with President Xi Jinping was the synthetic opioid fentanyl. Blinken was seeking Xi's help in curbing China's production of the precursor chemicals used to create the drug, which US authorities say is responsible for a surge in overdose deaths. America's deadly opioid crisis has been likened to the crisis of addiction endured by China in the 19th century, when British imperial power paved the way for China's century of humiliation, sparking two bloody conflicts known as the Opium Wars. Brendan Wan has the story. Eighteenth century China probably was the wealthiest, most powerful, most cultural, civilized countries in the world. Back in 1790, 
Britain's East India Company was busy keeping up with the Brits' insatiable demand for tea. Shipping around 10,000 leaves from East Asia to London every year. Most of it grown in China. But there was one major issue. China would only accept payment in silver. And Britain was fast running out of it. China hoarded all the silver that came in through the tea trade. So in order for the tea trade to go off, the foreigners need to get some of that silver out. So the East India Company had an idea. Create demand for a product that they could easily source on a grand scale from the British colony of India, opium. Before long, more opium was being imported into China than tea was being exported to Britain. Addiction skyrocketed. It's a cultural on consumption, it's leisure, it's entertainment, and it's embedded within Chinese culture because when you have guests coming, you offer them a pipe because it's polite, because it was the most expensive thing. And then you go to a restaurant, you have a meal, and then here's a pipe. And you go to the brothel, especially men, the first thing you do is have a round of smoke and then you get on to do other business. So it's deeply embedded in Chinese popular cultural. It's very hard to get rid of. Smoking opium was finally outlawed by the Qing government. But Britain ignored that and continued to smuggle into the country anyway. The destructive nature of opium was very obvious by the 1830s on the eve of the Opium War. You have people dying on the street. You have men selling their business, selling their wives, selling their children because they're so addicted. People have no money to pay taxes. Business go bust. What happens is local governments go bankrupt. That is why the emperor decided and declare war on opium. It's not because he cared about the people who died on the street. It's about money. So the Qing government took action and destroyed thousands of opium containers. When a British envoy arrived in Canton in 1839 to demand compensation, China refused, so Britain declared war, leading China to a humiliating defeat. The origins of the opium war is really not quite opium, you know? It, it's kind of a wrong name. You could call it the tea war, or you could call it the silver war. It kind of served as a wake-up call for many Chinese officials who realized China was falling behind and China needed to change. The war ended in 1842 with the signing of the Treaty of Nanjing. The treaty forced China to open up ports to British trade, cede Hong Kong, and pay for the cost of the war. This marked the beginning of China's century of humiliation. The Treaty of Nanking, it began what John King Fairbank, sort of the godfather of Chinese history, called the century of unequal treaties, because immediately after the treaty was signed, the French and the Russians and the Americans and just about everybody would come along. So it, it, it's kind of a watershed moment in Chinese modern Chinese history. In 1856, with tens of millions of Chinese still in the grip of addiction, the Chinese seized the ship suspected of smuggling opium, providing opportunity for Britain to declare war once again. It was bloodier and far more damaging than the first, and led to yet more punitive treaties with more foreign powers. It's so sad that the scramble for China left a huge scar on the national memory. China's addiction to opium finally ended under Chairman Mao in 1953. But the legacy of the opium wars continues to this day. Everything China is doing today is to prove to you, to the West, we are better than you are. And of course, the political consequences that we all see today, China become very aggressive. It's, it's because she suffered so much. Sam, it's interesting to see how the 100 years of humiliation is still being used by the CCP now as propaganda.
Yeah, that analogy is still very powerful today. You know, growing up in China, I was taught about it in schools, and students were constantly reminded of how much Chinese people had suffered during that time. You know, from things like invasions by Western powers or unequal treaties, which led to the occupations of Hong Kong and Macau, for example. Those things do provoke a deep sense of shame in you and anger as well. So obviously, Chinese politicians can be very opportunistic about it, and Xi Jinping's. Greatest ambition is to end that century of humiliation and to bring a national rejuvenation.、Mm, I'm really glad that we covered that. I know we're not allowed to have favourite packages, but I reckon that is one of the top ones outside of the ones that I've done. Obviously, just because it's so informative around the history of how we got here today. China's annual Dragon Boat Festival is in full swing this week. The traditional Chinese holiday kicks off with feasts of sticky dumplings and dragon boat races. And I've never paddled before, but I braved the cold waters of Sydney Harbour to get into the festival spirit. Go! One, two, three, four, five, up! Get up! It's a fun sport. You always have a good workout after it, and then you always have fun friends. We're competitive on the water, super friendly. Of course, growing up, this is the only team sports that I ever play. Jessie and her teammates have been training for years, but I'm just a first timer. One, two,、oh. Each dragon boat can carry about 20 paddlers, and the drummer who sits in the front sets the pace, while the person who stands at the back steers the boat. But the secret is powerfully paddling in sync. While dragon boating is a popular sport in Australia, it's a tradition in China. People hold annual races as a part of the Dragon Boat Festival. Let's go, team! Like this one in Jiangsu Province in China's east, more than 800 athletes from 38 teams participated in this year's tournament. The Dragon Boat Race has a 2,500-year-rich history of ancient ceremonial and ritualistic traditions in China. It's believed to commemorate an ancient poet, Qu Yuan. As a Chinese overseas, it's part of my identity. The Dragon Boat is the way I connected my heritage,、um, my root. So that's also very important to me. Now you can find Dragon Boat races across Asia, the Pacific, North America, and beyond.